<laughs> the music. <laughs> Hi, and uh, welcome to New, uh, New Jersey Vietnam Veterans First uh, sc uh, Scholars Lecture Series. Uh, I'm curator Mike Thornton. Uh, this series is free to the public through the generosity and support of the New Jersey's Council for the Humanities. It's my honor to invite you, the public, into a moderated conversation with leading historians and individuals whose experiences offer new and inclusive insights into the complexities of the Vietnam era and its enduring legacy. Our Vietnam Scholars Series seeks to inform future exhibitions here at our Vietnam Era Museum. Live stream on Zoom webinar and on Facebook live stream. If you're having trouble uh, tonight, we are working on that. Stay tuned. Uh, this limited series will be archived on our website as a resource for teachers, students, and a general audience nationwide. Before we begin, though, a little wayfinding. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, this program is run very similar to our vet chat series. We have turned off the chat feature on Zoom. So if you want to ask questions, please use the uh, Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, operators are standing by. Uh, we're also monitoring Facebook Live broadcast, and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, I'm going to speak with our guest for about 45 minutes to an hour and then open it up for a Q&A. Approximately 11,000 American military women served in Vietnam during the war, and of those, that number, 90% of them were nurses in the Army, Navy, or Air Force. Eight were killed overseas carrying out their duty, and here to talk about her experience and the challenges facing women veterans coming home is Diane Carlson Evans, a former nurse who at the age of 21 went to Vietnam in 1968, first with the burn unit of the 36th Evacuation Hospital in Vung Tau, and then later at Pleiku with the 71st Evacuation Hospital located in the Central Highlands. Founder of the Vietnam Women's Memorial located in Washington, D.C., Diane Carlson Evans is a poet, speaker, and author of Healing Wounds, a Vietnam War Combat Nurse's 10-Year Fight to Win Women, a Place of Honor in Washington, D.C., Diane Carlson Evans, thank you for joining us. I'm so glad you're here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Welcome. Thank you, Mike. I'm honored to do it and uh, looking forward to, uh, I was delighted to learn more about the New Jersey Memorial. I knew about it years ago, but I've never had the opportunity to visit it. And I commend you for all the efforts you're putting into oh. a memorial to remember our generation. Well, no, thank you for your service and thank you for being here tonight. Diane, you know, I I think uh, you know, we can't put the cart before the horse, but um, we know you were a nurse, but how how did that path begin? How did you grow up wanting to be a nurse? How did you end up an army nurse? Well, that's a very good question because there's always an origin to our life, right? And of course, I was born in Buffalo, Minnesota, and my parents, my dad was a dairy farmer, and my mother was a registered nurse. So I grew up in a small, a rural community um, amongst other farmers. I graduated from high school in 1964, wasn't really hearing too much about Vietnam in my high school years, but then I started nursing school in Minneapolis, and um, it's now almost 1965 uh, after my first year. And my brother is drafted because of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And I know that many of my 4-H buddies, uh, all, all boys, men, <laughs> boys they were then, um, and other farm boys were getting drafted and going to Vietnam. Yeah. So I now I know there's a war going on and my parents are very worried about my brother. And so I start watching the six, six o'clock news. And um, at the time we only had for the whole uh, school, there was one TV and then a student nurses lounge. And I would find myself just uh, attracted. I just had to see the news. And what I saw was helicopters bringing wounded to hospitals. I saw old men and women in their conical hats out in rice paddies. And I saw body bags out in fields and the jungle and and um, 
it, it was deeply disturbing to me, but I was very attracted to the fact that they must need nurses. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't long after that, I found myself in an Army Nurse Corps recruiter um, office, downtown Minneapolis, and I said, I want to go to Vietnam. How do I do that? <laughs> and she, she, of course, said, will you sign on the dotted line? But before she said that, she explained to me a little bit more about the student nurse program. So I, I, I have to ask, because our, our next guest who, who follows you next month is Kara Vuick, who is a historian of the yeah. Army Nurse Corps, right. and, and one of her her great interests are, are the various posters and ads that uh, attracted intelligent young women like yourself into, into the nursing career. Did you, do you have any memories of those posters? And did- Oh yeah, I have one behind me in my office. Oh, I could, yeah. <laughs> I, you should have warned me, I would have dug it out, just put oh. it right on the camera. Um, there was one and it, it was a beautiful woman. Of course she had to be beautiful, right? In, in a helmet. And it said, the most beautiful girl in the world, a US Army nurse. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was you know, a poster like, well, we're not naive. I mean, joining the Army isn't going to make me beautiful, right? And um, it, was, it, was, it, it was a profound poster, and I've never forgotten it. But then the, the information that she handed me before I left her office was a packet of beautiful nurses in white uniforms and they were in Panama and they were all over the world and they were having fun, right? There weren't any of uh, nurses uh, standing over an operating room table with blood and gore all around them. It was very sanitized. It was more about join the army and you'll have a, a vacation, you'll have a big adventure. It was uh, whitewashed, if you will, but I wasn't about to be whitewashed. I was watching the six o'clock news and I knew this wasn't an adventure. This was serious and um, men were wounded. And I followed my mother around in that hospital where she worked as much as I could. I got a job when I was, she got me a job when I was 15 at the hospital. And I worked with her uh, for six years before I went to Vietnam. So I had an introduction into trauma being in that small hospital where we had okay, tractor accidents. It's Minnesota, we had drownings. Uh, a train track nearby the hospital always, there was, I saw trauma and I saw it in nursing school. So the trauma itself didn't scare me, Mike. Other things frightened me later. And I'm sure you're gonna ask me about that. Well, yeah, but did that, um, did that, prepare you in any way or was it so completely different that it the two experiences had nothing to do with each other well that's that's a good question um so i have to answer it yes and no nothing prepares you for war but war itself mm. and nothing prepares you for the the um numbers of sheer wounded that come in at one time and you have mass casualties and how do you deal with that and what do you do first and and so the, the basic training that we had that the army gave us for six weeks at Fort Sam Houston, Texas was not a good preparation at all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's better now. I know nurses are getting more comprehensive, intense training than we had, but no, they didn't. The army didn't really prepare us. I happened to have gone to a very good nursing school and also had opportunities to do internships like at a general hospital and uh, in an emergency room. And I worked at the VA hospital for three months as an internship. So I tried to find as much experience as I could so that when I got to Vietnam, I could, I could jumpstart. I, I had already started IVs. I had already been in an ER and, and saw what triage was when one night five teenagers came in in a car accident and most of them uh, taking their last breaths. Mm -hmm. And, um, but no, war itself prepares you for um, the skills that will be necessary to help you save those lives, but also your own personal, how you deal with it personally. Yeah. And that takes time and it takes time to become brave. So you're not scared, witless, when you're the first time you hear an air raid siren and what, what am I supposed to do? oh, I'm supposed to grab my helmet and I'm supposed to grab my flak jacket and then I'm supposed to run. 
to my unit and, and make sure the IV bottles are, are hanging everywhere. So when the casualties come in, we have the supplies. And, and these are the, the, the things that we became very good at as nurses in Vietnam because of the sheer numbers. Yeah. If, if you're caring for a lot of patients, um, you're, you're becoming quite skilled quite quickly. Yeah. Well, before going, what, what were you most nervous about? Was it the, the threat of you know, enemy contact? Was it the fear of not being able to execute your duty? What was your biggest fear before you actually went over? I think my biggest, you know, when you're, when you're 21, it's like these 18, 19 year old, 20 year old boys who became men in Vietnam. We're young, so we, don't, we have this sense of immortality where we're gonna live forever, right? We don't, we don't see ourselves dead. I didn't see myself dead. Uh, that, that wasn't my biggest fear. I think it was for the men, for the boys who went to Vietnam, because they knew they were going to be in combat, perhaps. They were going to be carrying weapons. They were going to be shot at. They were going to shoot others. I didn't have those fears like, um, if you know, I'm in the jungle and what's going to happen when some enemy is, you know. My fears were um, not knowing what to do when a soldier depended on me. That was my biggest fear or that I would make a mistake that would harm someone or if I didn't do something quick enough if and I wasn't smart enough and if I wasn't brave enough that some disaster would happen and it would be my fault and and nurses felt this guilt this heavy mm -hmm. heavy burden on our shoulders because oftentimes it was just us and we were young there was no support we couldn't call somebody and say, well, come and help me out here. I don't know what to do. There was nobody to call. The resources were, there were not a lot of us. We had to figure out how to get things done on our own and uh, be quick learners. Mm -hmm. So my biggest fear was that someone would die on my watch and it would be my fault. Yeah. What was your introduction to Vietnam? How did you end up, what was your journey there? And Tell us about that first, those first impressions. Well, I left um, end of July, 1968, when the, the impression of my country, the United States of America was under extreme turmoil, uh, war protests, anti-war, anti-soldier, um, university buildings being bombed, flags being burned, uh, my generation opposing the war and the whole, the hippie movement, of course, and all of the above. And uh, I didn't know what to make of that. I didn't know if the war was right or wrong uh, or if we should be fighting it. All I knew was they need nurses. So I left with that in my rear view mirror when I got on the plane to go to Vietnam and I landed and it was dark and uh, I could see when we got off the plane, there were all these big holes in the tarmac where it had been rocketed and, and a, a young man, a young soldier with a bandolier of ammunition, he looked very hardened and his weapon uh, told us there are four nurses and nurses first, women off the plane first, and we're going down off the plane and, and they said, keep your head down, keep your head down and get to that bus over there and the bus had blackened out windows with chicken wire on it and the smell and the stench and the heat, all of that you never, you never forget. But um, he just kept, kept saying, keep your head down and get in the bus. We did. And then we were transferred to a, an, a transitional building. And then they gave us our orders. And my orders were to get on a helicopter in two days after I got my uniform, my boots, all of that. And that helicopter was going to take me to the 36th evacuation hospital in Bung Tau. And I didn't know what ward, what unit, what aspect of nursing. I had no idea where they would assign me until I got there. Huh. Huh. Well, once there, how, how immediate before you were in, in action? Was it hours, days? Was there any, like, it was any, the next day. any it was I was the gonna next say, day. any attempt to have a buffer zone to kind of acclimate okay. at all? No, because it's 1968 and there's a, the hospital, it was 400, it's Mike, it was a 400 bed evacuation hospital and just very quickly, an evacuation hospital was just that. Get the patients in, stabilize them and evacuate them out, get them out to send them to other uh, rehabilitative hospitals where they can recover more fully 
or send them on the Arivac chain back to the United States with those Air Force nurses and send them to Guam, Japan, uh, the United States, uh, wherever deemed that patient's recovery was necessary. The hospital was full and I got my assignment and they said, we're assigning you to med surge. That made me happy because I like post-op and pre-op surgical nursing, not the operating room, but pre-surgery and post-surgery. And I found the ward that I was assigned to. I walked in and every, 65 beds and every bed was full. And it was hot. It was over 100 degrees and there was no air conditioning. <laughs> and the head nurse, uh, Major Zuniga said, well, Lieutenant, welcome to Vietnam. And here's your, here's your assignment. This is what you're gonna do today. And I was like, okay. It was, there really was not an orientation. Orientation was just getting to work and finding, finding out where everything, what, where are the supplies? Where, where is this, where is that? And just um, on the go, uh, just uh, on the ground running, boots on the ground, get going, get to work. And all around me, I saw hardworking medics uh, mm -hmm. doing the dressing changes and um, all the hands-on care that our medics do. And then of course our job as nurses, a lot of it was getting out the medication, doing the IVs, IV medication, uh, hanging blood and doing the skilled nursing that we're, we're trained to do. So it was, it was just boots on the ground and start running. How did you, you know, the dailiness of all of that trauma, um, how did you protect yourself emotionally to be able to carry on day after day? Were there any strategies that you used or how did you mentally prepare um, to do that work? I think the brain is quite fascinating, isn't it? The brain tells us how to um, think and feel and, and um, how to survive and at first, and I know I've talked to other nurses about this, at first, I think that first week or two or whatever it took, we felt everything. We felt the horror, we felt the sadness. Uh, some nurses went out back and vomited. Mm -hmm. If something came in that was really horrific, especially the burn unit, when we had those kids come in, it was, we had a physical, physiological response to the trauma, if you will a physiological response. Well, if we kept that up, we'd be out in the toilet all the time throwing up. Um, and then there's the emotional response. And that emotional response was, um, you know, can we deal with this? Um, I can't deal with this or, you know, what, you know, how am I gonna? And then we go to work and we get busy and we shut our emotions down and we don't know that's happening. It's a process, it's, it takes time. I don't know how much time, but I know my emotions, after a while I became like a robot. I just went to the next bed, the next and the next to do my job, be compassionate, be caring, be kind, not lose our emotional ability to, to touch and heal and be compassionate, but it no longer, um, it, but it sometimes did, depending on the patient. It no longer uh, bothered me or bothered us, uh, majority of us nurses and the doctors too, that to do our, to do our job, we had to forget about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Our needs were secondary. They came first. And when we realized psychologically, emotionally, that our primary role for being there was, this wasn't about us. It wasn't about how we felt. It was about the motto of the Army Nurse Corps is preserve the fighting strength. We were there for them. And you forgot about yourself and your own needs. And um, at the end of the day, you went back to your hooch and you did whatever it was you needed to do to decompress. For some, uh, the, the officers club, you know, there was alcohol to drink. Um, there was that. There were, um, my, mine was music. I would go back to my hooch and I'd got a reel-to-reel -reel recorder uh, and um, I taped music and listened to music, mostly anti-war music, which I thought was great. Anti-war music, Joan Baez, <laughs> loved her. Mm -hmm. um, we found our way outside of work, I think to decompress, um, some partied, I say some, we all did different things. I, I wasn't 
a lot into partying. Um, I was tired. And I, I, thankfully, I didn't choose to do drugs and alcohol in Vietnam, although that was a choice. And I'm not judgmental. Um, whatever it took to help you get through that year. But for me, the consequence would have been too great. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't really t um, experimented with alcohol and certainly not drugs. And I had, it ha I had had a couple of drinks when I had my 21st birthday and I thought, I am never doing that again. That did not feel good. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say, Mike, is to answer your question. We each found our way how we were going to survive um, the days, the minutes and the days and the year ahead of us. Yeah. Well, you know, Diane, you, you have been, you have been interviewed and you have, you have storied what happened in that year to you so often that I, it doesn't feel right for me to press for any one particular anecdote, but if there were one or two stories that are just symbolic of what would later motivate you to create the work that you did to create the memorial and your, you know, really formative to your experience as, as a veteran, as a combat veteran, um, you know, what, what could you share? I, I can definitely, there's two incidences that I've never been able to forget. Well, there's three. There was the burn unit um, where I was working at the 36 evacuation hospital. And Mike, I knew our pilots were dropping napalm and white phosphorus. I saw those photos on the six o'clock news when I was in nursing school. And it was so horrific to be, it was a television. It was our first television war, right? Yeah. Um, Young people may not understand that, but it, in Vietnam, it was the war was televised. And now I'm seeing bombs dropping napalm and white phosphorus and villages are burning up. And all I can think about is, oh my God, there must be people in there. And the civilians must be um, suffering and dying. Well, it was Christmas Eve and um, if this was a, a, a Vietnamese village and many of them were Catholic you know there was Buddhism there was a variety of religions but the French had been there and there was there were Catholic uh, villagers and it was Christmas Eve and their village was bombed and um, the church was hit and um, they brought over 50 52 to be exact if I remember burned children into our unit they didn't bring in the adults because they, the chopper pilots who brought them in wanted to save the children's lives. But mm -hmm. now the children are separated, separated from their parents. And so we nurses now are dealing with, um, and I'm not a pediatric nurse, and now we have all these, uh, how do, you know, pediatric medicine is very different than adult medicine. And we had to learn on the fly and the doctors would come in and tell us what to do. And then we did it, but, and then there was the debridement of the burns and the sulfamyelin that we use for that to prevent pseudomonas and all the things that we do. But the trauma in that was these were children. Yeah. These were children, the innocents that were, um, you know, hurt during this horrific war. So now my questions are, why are we here? Why are we dropping bombs on it? What is this for? What is our mission? This is about communism. I don't under quite get that. I, I'm, I'm like horrified, talk about horrified. So then, and now to answer your question, I'm starting to question the war and I want answers and I'm not getting them. The next, now I'm sent up to play coup. I asked for a transfer. I told the chief nurse, I said, you know, I've done this for six months. I'd like to go further north to where the fighting, where the action is. So I've got the skills, let me go. And she said, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> well, I got my orders for play coup, which was, just a few kilometers from the Cambodian border. Now I'm gonna answer your question. Mm -hmm. um, we're being lied to. Uh, our president is saying, um, well, we're not in Cambodia. We're not in Cambodia. And of course, LBJ, you know, before Nixon had said, we're gonna win this war at all costs. Well, yeah, we knew what the cost was. It was, hum it was human lives, ours and theirs. So when this, came out that we're not in Cambodia. Well, this, the 4th Infantry Division was in Cambodia. They were being hit hard and our hospital at Pleiku was supporting the 4th Infantry Division. 
So this colonel comes into my unit because I'm head nurse. And he says to me, Lieutenant, um, we're not in Cambodia. So make sure there is nothing that says in the charts where these troops are injured. And I didn't say anything to the colonel. I was a lieutenant. He walked out the door and I, I, that was it. They can lie to us, but to ask me to lie for them, they crossed the line. So every single patient I took care of, I said, where were you injured? And he said, Cambodia, ma'am. So I took the, I wrote it on the chart, injured in Cambodia, injured in Cambodia. So if there's some charts in the archives that have Lieutenant- I was gonna Cal say, I wish you go look in the, in at Cambodia. Nara. <laughs> so I was, Mike, I was pushing back. Yeah. I, I was like, this is not, this is wrong. These are lies and the body counts were lies. They elevated the member of Viet Cong that we killed and gave less body counts for American soldiers because the winning and the losing of the war was based on body count. Mm -hmm. And I have one more quick, if, if you Absolutely. want me to answer oh, please, that. Please, please. Which galvanized me, if that's the right, yeah, yeah it galvanized me, mm -hmm. that's the right way to put it, in, into my persistence that came later to build the memorial for the women is that I realized that um, I realized the night that our hospital was one of the nights there were many. Our hospital was rocketed and mortared one night, and the thuds were extremely close. It was just all around us. They were they were targeting the hospital and the radar, which was right next to the hospital, and so all chaos has brought has broken out, and um, I'm running around getting patients under the bed and uh, making sure the bloodlines haven't been pulled out and taking care of the connections for the IVs. And then there's the ventilators and we had generators and if the electricity went out, the, generator, the generators would kick in and then they would quit and then we'd be ambooing and it was like chaos. And there was this little girl, a mountain yard girl who had been burned. This was not the burn unit. This was a post-operative unit where our soldiers had had operations and were recovering. And um, we had one little girl in the unit, a mountain yard girl who had suffered burns and she was screaming. She was in pain. And the sounds of the rockets and thuds terrified her because that's what had happened in her village. So after all the, the casualties were taken care of by one other nurse and my four medics, um, I went over to her and I couldn't touch her or hold her because of her burns around her abdomen. And so I just held her hand and I crawled under her crib. And mm -hmm. then, you know, the barrage around us and the chaos around us. And that little girl was screaming. And these GIs who have been wounded, all they can hear is a little girl screaming. And, you know, the, 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 the artillery, all incoming and outgoing now, artillery. It, this is like a nightmare. It's surreal. How do you even describe it? I'm trying, but I'm not doing a very good job. But that little girl literally screamed herself to death. She died the next day. And um, mm -hmm. when the uh, next event happened where there were mass casualties, I was told I ran out of my hooch and got on the phone and they said, Lieutenant, open up the spare ward. My medic and I went in there, we opened up the ward and 27 patients came in gurneys to that unit. 27, because I had written my, a letter home to tell my mother this, so it's all documented, the date, the time, what happened. And it was just him and me. And um, I was told, you've got 27 guys coming in by uh, Chinook helicopter, and it's just me and the medic. And mm -hmm. so uh, I, <laughs> It was such a bizarre situation. And finally I said to my medic, I said, something's wrong here. None of these boys have bullet holes. There's, they're all near death. They're all almost, you know, they are, they are hypoxic. They have low blood pressures. They have low pulse. They're, some of them are barely breathing, but they haven't been wounded. So something else is going on here. But my job that when the doctor came in just said, just get IVs started on every one of these guys. We got to get them hydrated. Hydration was going to save their life. Mm. And so it was blackout because now we're being rocketed again. And we had blackout at night. This was at night. 
And so it's dark and my corpsman has a flashlight. Now, remember these guys are hypoxic, low blood pressure, so their veins are collapsed. I have to start IVs on guys who are so dirty when we were trying to you know, rub this air, it was just black. And I said to the corpsman, I said, just hold that flashlight and we're gonna get them all done. And one by one by one, I started 27 IVs on these young men. And years later, Mike, now we're gonna to get to the Vietnam Women's Memorial. When I had to battle and slay all those dragons in Washington, DC, who said, no, there'll never ever be a statue honoring women on the net, you know, that whole story. I, when, when they started, uh, putting obstacles in my way that, you know, this isn't going to happen. I thought to myself, you know, if I could do what I did in Vietnam, I can do this. Yeah. Hmm. Well, on that note, I mean, thinking about coming home from all of that, and if we can go back in time, you know, let, let's say it's the, the late 70s, you know, at what point did you, after all of that, start thinking of yourself as a veteran? I, you know, everyone who served in everyone who serves in the military is a veteran, but a combat veteran who had been to war had seen the reality of that. When, when did that sort of start to crystallize in your thought, in your mind, that idea? Not until 1982. Oh, and 1982 with when the the vietnam veterans memorial the wall yeah. was dedicated in washington dc there's a um you know leading up to that yeah i've i've read there's a there's a quote in that uh i, I wrote it down <laughs> that jan scruggs when they were working with the discussing with the vva um the process it, you know said that if we men have been in the woodwork, then our sisters have been beneath the basement floor. And is there, I mean, the Vietnam veteran had to kind of go into hiding after the war due to the social stigma of service, but how did that play out for women? What was your experience? Well, us women could hide. We didn't look like Vietnam vets, did we? Yeah. And we weren't even allowed to be members of the VFW, so we weren't going into VFW um, place, you know, um, posts, the yeah. American Legion did accept women, but we were reluctant mm -hmm. to um, face the public because we too had been uh, facing humiliation and um, remarks that were unkind and uh, protesting the war. And many of us just decided the way to survive was to not talk about it like the brother, like our brother vets. So for me personally, I didn't talk about it. I didn't want it. I was angry at my husband if he ever mentioned to anyone. I served in Vietnam and I told him not to tell anybody. I didn't want to talk about it. But I went on, you know, we, we were married. I was still working until I had four kids. And But in 1982, when I went to the dedication of the wall, it was the first time, the first time since Vietnam that I allowed myself to really think about all those um, men I had cared for and the experience and think about the women I had served with. And then it was finding two names on the wall that I went to find that really began this whole process of coming to terms with my experience. And um, there were consequences to my experience in Vietnam. And I guess I was afraid of those consequences and now I was going to have to face them. And what were those consequences? Nightmares, um, anxiety, depression, uh, feelings of guilt, um, uh, feeling estranged from other women my age. I wasn't, I, there wasn't anybody I could talk to. Uh, us women had lost touch with each other. We hadn't stayed in contact. I didn't have someone to talk to. So to answer your question specifically, after the dedication, I knew that I had to do something because I was suicidal. And I had four kids and a husband. And um, I had heard about this new concept called a vet center. 
And in mm -hmm. Minneapolis, a vet center had opened and a vet center was there to help veterans talk, face their experience in Vietnam. And some, I, I decided to call and say, um, I, I understand that Vietnam veterans can come to you and um, they're, but I'm wondering, is it open to women? And he said, well, are you a veteran? And I said, I don't know. I served in Vietnam and he said, well, what were you, why? And I said, well, I was in the army. And he said, you're a veteran and come in and see us. So I tiptoed in into that. Huh. Well, how did the, um, where was the, the idea after seeing the wall, how did the idea of a dedicated memorial to women who served there, how did that sort of crystallize in your mind? Was there a particular conversation or, or a moment where like, that's the best way to, to honor that, that service? What, how did it come about creatively? Two, two things, Mike. Um, it was an image and I'll tell you about that image. And it was also, when I went for the dedication, I wanted to find some other women vets. I wanted to find them again. I wanted to talk to them. I wanted to know how they were doing. And yeah. I, want, I, I wanted to reconnect now after all those years. And I didn't find a lot of them there, but there were some. Mm -hmm. And the image was um, a result of the controversy, as you know, about the wall. Some veterans didn't like the design. And that's another whole story. And you've already recorded that, I'm sure, in your museum about the the um, the animosity and the uh, controversy about the wall itself. So mm -hmm. these other veterans wanted something more heroic. They wanted a statue that portrayed right. men in Vietnam and they would be facing the wall and facing their brother soldiers. Um, at no time did they think about uh, a statue to women. Um, this was something they decided mm -hmm. for themselves. Well, when I saw the image, I came out in 1982 for the dedication. I was there in 83 for Veterans Day, and I went in 84 for the dedication of the statue of the three servicemen um, designed by Frederick Hart. Uh -huh. I went home and I told my husband, honey, if they're gonna have a statue to men, there has to be one to women because that memorial is now incomplete. The wall was complete. It had the eight women who died. Their names are on the wall. The statue, the addition of the statue of the three men now meant only men went to war. Yeah. And the visitor would see that statue of men and they wouldn't have a clue. They wouldn't question, well, there must have been women there too. It's hard pressed to find those eight women's names on the wall. And some of those names can also be men's names, if not all of those eight women. Uh, and it was, I'll never forget what he said. Because I said, honey, there has to be there has to be a statue to women. It just, I, you know, what about what about them? And he said, well, who's going to do that? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, but I have an idea. Mm -hmm. And and therein lies the journey, the beginning, the origin of the journey. Wow. Well, how on earth? How do you get going with that? How did you be, how, talk about that process of finding, of finding your sisters and rallying them to this, to this cause. How, how well, on earth, where would, how does one even start? Well, first there's the vision. First there's the vision. And then I have to admit, then there's the passion. Mm -hmm. And then, then there's also, you know, a spiritual component, I believe, and that's a calling. And I, I have to confess, I was at angry at God for 10 years saying, God, why me? Why didn't you pick somebody else to put this memorial up? This is too much work. It's too hard. And I'd rather be home with my four kids who were all under the age of 10 when I founded the Vietnam Women's Memorial. Wow. wow. So yeah. when something is meant to be, and this is kind of a spiritual component of, I think, my beliefs as well, when something is right and just and is meant to be, um, you find a way and you find allies, but there's events that take place. So after the dedication of the wall, Minnesota decided to have a welcome home for Vietnam vets. This is now 1983. And it was taking place, I think August or September. 
And it was going to be a parade downtown Minneapolis and for Minnesota veterans. And um, I decided to go. And I, I took my two oldest sons with me who were very young. They wanted to march in the parade with mom. And I put on my jungle fatigue blouse and my combat boots and my boonie hat. And we marched in the parade. Following the parade, we were at the hotel, the headquarters hotel, mm -hmm. and there were sculptures, bronze sculptures on display, designed and created by Roger Brodine, a Minnesota sculptor, whose sculpture of a Vietnam veteran stands on the Capitol grounds at St. Paul, Minnesota. I was so moved by this sculpture, I talked to the person behind you know, the exhibit area, and I said, are, are you the sculptor? And he said, no. Uh, he just left. I said, well, how do I reach him? <laughs> and he said, well, here's his card. Well, the next morning, his name was Roger Brodine. And I said, uh, Mr. Brodine, I am so-and-so. I was a nurse in Vietnam. And I said, I was so moved. Your sculptures are so beautiful. They portray the men I, I remember them in Vietnam. And he said, well, thank you. And I said, well, have you ever thought of sculpting a woman? Five months later, Roger and I had worked on and he completed a prototype of, a, of a, a woman in uniform. So now I have something tangible. Now I make some phone calls and I call other Vietnam veterans. I call some attorneys and we have a meeting. And I'm living in River Falls, Wisconsin at the time, but that's just over the border and an hour away. I was in Minneapolis, set up a meeting with the Vietnam Veterans Leadership Program director at the time. And I, I asked him uh, to help me set up this meeting. And then Roger Brodine was there, several other veterans, a couple of attorneys. And I said, I want to put this statue in Washington, DC to honor the women who served in Vietnam. And it got started. And that's how you start, Mike. And then pretty soon, you just figure it out. You got to you got to have a five hundred one c three. You got to start a nonprofit. You need a board of directors. You need you know to raise funds. You need to to check with the IRS and get an IRS status if you're going to raise money. And then you have, then you have to do publicity. And we did we did it day by day by day by day. And basically that that it, it was it, what it was about was finding people who were willing to help you and finding the right people who had the right skills, you know, the CPA who could be the treasurer, um, you know, all, all of the above. But I had handwritten, it's now in the Library of Congress. I had handwritten a strategy. I'd, this was my midnight project. And I had pages and pages of the strategy. What would we have to do? And then I got overwhelmed and I was like, mm -hmm. oh no, I can't do this. This is too much work. And I realized, how naive I was when I, I look back now and really realize how naive I was to think that to think that I could do this. And, and then I paid the price, the consequences of um, you know, being out there and then being bombarded with mean-spirited opposition and all the people who were against it and not sleeping at night. And, but if I had known what I was going to go through to achieve the fruition, if you will, of the Vietnam Women's Memorial, I would never have started. I would not have started. I, it's a good thing I was naive because if I had known, I would not have embarked on that effort. It was hard. It was painful, um, excruciating at times. It, I was away from my children. Thankfully, my mother came. And, and this is where you have a support system. My husband was always backing me. Just go do what you need to do, honey. You know, have, have your mom come. He loved my mother. <laughs> the kids loved my mother. I had support. I had a lot of family support. Uh, yeah. And then I found all these incredible people to help me. And I did not do this alone. Yeah. It was... Um, a handful of people and then it was a lot of people and then it was hundreds of volunteers who 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 embarked on the journey with me yeah but to get them to stick with you because some dropped off they got angry they got tired they they quit believing that i could be that i could 
accomplished what I had hoped to set out and they just quit, but others stayed. But the, the whole idea behind it, finishing what you start is to not give up. Yeah. You know, persistence overcomes resistance. So, um, well, yeah. You know, I'm curious to know more, um, you know, what starts out as a, just a, a visual representation of, of a woman who served, um, what was the what was the core opposition to this? Is it was it just wrote sexism? Was was it that that they just didn't want that image reflected in the wall? Was it that that was not representative of all women? What were what were the core critiques of a of a memorial there to women? All of the above, what you just talked about. But when when I finally decided after fifty years to write my story. Healing Wounds, which was published um, when COVID broke out, my book was published uh, in 2020. Um, it took me 50 years to write my personal story because I knew it was going to be hard and I'd have to be honest. And a, a wonderful author told me, Diane, the only good memoir is an honest one. And I was going to have to go back and relive all of Vietnam and the painful the pain and anguish of building that memorial. What the book gave me was um, an opportunity to reflect and look back and identify why, why were so many people against honoring women veterans who had served during a very unpopular war. We were all volunteers in the army. We didn't have to serve, 265,000 of us around the world. Um, we, women deserved recognition. They deserved, they needed to heal from the wounds of war, those who went to Vietnam. And so as I reflected and with my co-author who was helping coach me to get through this, the, the majority, if not all, Mike, of the opposition was from men, okay? Mm. These were powerful men, yeah. many of them Vietnam veterans. They did not want any addition to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial that was of a woman. And I realized with the help of my co-author, he said, Diane, they were territorial. This was their memorial. They built it, they wanted it, it's what they wanted and it's for them. And at the time, what I was telling Congress when I finally got to Congress after all the rejections with the three agencies in Washington DC where we had brought our proposal and were rejected, the Roger Brodine statue, the first design was rejected. Mm -hmm. But okay, I think in my heart of hearts, I knew public art is controversial. Mm -hmm. By now I know that, that you know we, we might have to negotiate on the design but what was non-negotiable to me was they said that we could not have the site at the Vietnam. We could go wherever, we could go down the Potomac, one said. He said, you can go back to Minnesota with your statue, but you're not getting it here mm. at, on our, at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. They were territorial. And then, of course, my testimony said, you know, if the men belong here at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, we belong here too. We went to Vietnam. We were with them then and we helped to bring them home. And if not for us, the wall would be much wider and much higher. We nurses helped to bring those men home. If they belong here, we belong here with them for all time and eternity. Mm -hmm. And we only wanna complete the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. We're not here to compete with it. We would, our, our statue doesn't have to be twice as big. <laughs> we just feel we wanna complete the memorial because we men and women serve together uh, in the military, and this is where we belong. So, of course, that was my main argument. And um, they had some very unreasonable and irrational arguments that were actually quite comical when we look back at them. But I decided, we decided, I'll say we, the board of directors, that if we couldn't work with these men, we would work around them. Huh. And what we did is we went on this huge publicity all 50 states, we just, we hired a publicist. And what we wanted was stories of the women who'd served in Vietnam and the women who had served all over the world during that era. Who were they? What were they doing? And who else besides nurses were in Vietnam? Well, we found out plenty, the Red Cross women, the photojournalists, the air traffic controllers, the intelligence officers. It wasn't just nurses. 
And so we went on this blitz. And, you know, local hometown papers love to find a story. Yeah. So they were out there, you know, and we helped identify. So we had a, a national volunteer, every state had a volunteer coordinator, and it was their job to find the women who had served. And so we had a strategy and it, it worked. And then Morley Safer on 60 Minutes did us a big favor, the biggest favor, when in 1989, he put five of us. He called, when you get a call for, from 60 Minutes, you start to sweat. <laughs> I'll never forget that call. And it was Morley Safer's uh, rep, uh, person, right arm, who called to say, Mr. Safer wants you to come on 60 Minutes and, and uh, talk about why you think there should be a statue honoring women. And he wants you to find four other women. So five of us went on with Mr. Safer on 60 Minutes in 1989. And Mr. Safer, who had been in Vietnam yeah. for five years, off and on covering the war, he grilled us on 60 Minutes. He asked us questions that we were terrified to mm. answer. And all five of us, we were terrified to go on 60 Minutes because all of us had not talked a lot about Vietnam to even our husbands. And now we're gonna tell the world um, yeah. what we did. That was a turning point because after that, after Sunday evening, the next day I go into the office and I, I can't keep up with the phone and we're getting all this mail and we're getting telegrams. I put in three more phones. I started hiring staff. We had to reply to all these letters, these heartfelt letters that said, um, we didn't know that nurses were in Vietnam. We, we want to help you build that statue. And I wish I could give more, but this is all I have. The most priceless letter we got was from a, um, a veteran who had a disability check. He, he sent us his disability check and he said, dear nurses, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here to write you this letter. I'm going to send you my check every month until you have that statue built. Please don't tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. <laughs> so the turning point, Mike, was now the stories about who we are were out there and people wanted to help. They wanted to know more about us. They wanted to support us and they wanted to see that statue built. Now we're getting momentum. So we're push, pushing the naysayers off to the side. Goodbye. We don't, you know, you're, it's not working anymore for you to push back and throw all these obstacles in our way. We're moving forward without you. And we did. Yeah. yeah. Well, a, a break from the politics and adventure of all of that. <laughs> um, just thinking a minute for about memorials as uh as public artworks and as objects and you know your design evolved as as in all all creative projects things things change but there's something uh, that has become um almost a feature of a vietnam memorial and in particular whenever there is a nurse or a woman depicted is this um that aspect of, of reaching out and making sort of a a close to physical connection or or some type of embrace and you know it's off it's often a nurse and i'm just curious about what in well as you were designing the memorial and certainly setting building on what had been done in the past but also setting kind of new standards um how did you sort of symbolize the experience of women what kind of went into that creative thought process well, it was a process. And as I said, our first a prototype, the first design that I brought to the Commission of Fine Arts in Washington, DC, the most prestigious, you know, that is a very prestigious committee. And they, it's, they, they hold the lock to the gate to keep anything off the mall unless it meets all this criteria, the Commemorative Works Act, which was passed in the 80s. So, but when they rejected our statue, I realized, all right, they won't, they won't, they won't approve this design and they have to approve it or it will not go on the mall. But what they couldn't do was take the site away from us. That site had to be ours. After all, it says on the wall, dedicated to the men and women who served in Vietnam or, or in, in the armed forces in Vietnam. That's the inscription on the wall at the top at the apex. So then 
the, they rejected the statute, but I came back and I said to the board, they can't, have, they can't take the site away from us. That's not their purview. Commission mm -hmm. of Fine Arts can't do that. They, they, uh, their review is for art. And so we went to Congress. It took two years, but we got the bill passed. Now we need a design. So we hired a design competition expert. That's what they're out there. They just do national, they do art, they do competitions for public art. And it took a year, but we uh, formulated the criteria for our statue. And we knew it would get political. We knew it would get, it would get hard. So we put it in the uh, criteria that this design must show the visitor in an instant that these are the women who served in Vietnam. Mm. Now, what does that tell you? That's gotta be something that yeah. portrays us, right? Anyway, long story short, we had over 300 entries, I think 335 entries. Some of them were very bizarre, very unusual, very contemporary. They weren't, you know, most of them were not sculptures. They were landscape features, there were bas reliefs, there were weird things that it's hard for me to describe. Then we saw uh, Glenna Goodacre's piece. And I was on the design competition jury. There were five design professionals and four of us veterans. I uh, had two men. We we embraced and collaborated with our brother veterans. We had, and we had two women on the design competition jury. So long story short, um, and this is in the book. If you want to know more details about that, or at the archives, which have, uh, all of our archives are now in the Library of Congress, um, we settled on the Glenna Goodacre piece. Why? Because of what you just described, Mike. Mm -hmm. It was. Um, a sculpture, we only saw a drawing, but oh, wow. it, it was a drawing. It wasn't a sculpture. We didn't see 3D. We didn't see a statue. We saw a, it could, the competition could only be drawings. Huh. And then a description by the artist. And she said, this would be a sculpture in the round so that people could walk around it and interact with each figure. Mm -hmm. And the kneeling or the, um, the standing woman like you said, is connected. She's holding the hand like she's there. She's holding the elbow of the nurse who is focused on the wounded soldier. The nurse is holding like the piata, if you will, yeah. holding the wounded soldier across her lap. He has a field dressing across his eyes and his chest. He has a chest wound, as you can see, because she's attending to a chest wound. The standing woman is looking up as if for a helicopter, because that's what we did in Vietnam. Glenna Goodacre captured that. Or she said she could be looking up for God. Well, the helicopter was God in yeah. Vietnam. I mean, it was the savior. It was. And then the statue had to be altered because she had another standing woman who was holding a, a baby that was skeletal. And we knew that that wouldn't pass the Commission of Fine Arts because we could not make a political statement. We were told that we could not make a political statement. Well, I think 58,000 names on the wall is a political statement. But so when I called Glenna Goodacre to say, Ms. Goodacre, uh, we would like to talk to you about having your design, um, uh, work with you on your design and see this in, in sculptural form. If you could send us a 24 inch a replica or it's called a Mac hat. Yeah. And I said, but we have to ask you to alter it. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, can you take the baby away? And she said, why? Mm -hmm. uh, everything I've read is you nurses cared for those babies in Vietnam. And I said, yes. And I was one of them, many babies. I said, but it makes a political statement. And so she said, how long have I got? And I said, two weeks. And she said, okay. So what she came up with, instead of that second uh, woman standing, she has her kneeling. And this is the woman that portrays the futility and the anguish of the war. And very quickly, I have to say, what Glenna did was just, um, what's the word? It was just magnificent what she, the essence, she captured the essence of our service in Vietnam because everything was sandbagged. Our hospitals were sandbagged. Our hooches were sandbagged. Everything was sandbagged. So she has us on a setting of sandbags. That's the setting. And as you go around it, the, Glenna said the interpretation of this statue is up to the viewer. There is no rank. 
there is no identifying insignia. And, and the only thing that, you know, it, it's, there's dog tags on one of the nurses and then um, the way their features and their hair and the uniform, it's, it's women. She's portraying women and, and it's emotive. Um, she, it, it makes you feel something when you, when you're looking at the nurse, you know what she's doing. And then you, the connectedness to the standing woman looking up, I'm here, the helicopter is coming. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. And then the, the kneeling woman feeling like we felt at the end of the day, she can be in prayer. She can be tired. She, she's just, you know, um, expressing what war does to people. Yeah. And she's holding on to the soldier's helmet. So she's touching and hanging on. She's with him holding his helmet. Mm -hmm. We're all so connected. And um, I know that thousands of women now, and it has to be thousands, who I've connected with and received their letters and have talked to them over the years and have been at the memorial when they're there, um, they, they feel that the memorial no matter what they did or where they served, it, it's about them because it's about women and it's about our courage. It's about our vulnerabilities. Yeah. It's about our, um, you know, and, and we had to be brave. We didn't always feel brave, but I, I think it just portrays um, exactly what the mission of the Vietnam Women's Memorial when we started out, what we wanted to accomplish. And it, the setting is very serene it's very um, sacred. It, you feel safe when you're there and people come and they cry and they laugh and they hug and they talk and it's a place. It's a sense of place that gives women a feeling that we do belong here. This is our place too. And um, yeah, I don't know what more to say about that. All right. <laughs> I am. Um... I have a few more questions for you, but I am I am going to actually open it up to the audience to uh, to uh, to ask. We do we do have a couple. They've been waiting very very patiently. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, this is from uh, Michael Cole, uh, who's actually one of our volunteers here. Um, Hi, Michael. I know who Michael Cole is. Yeah. It says uh, he says hi from from Doc and. Uh, um, did you ever run out of med medical supplies? And second, if you could give your life over, what if any changes would you make? Yes, we did run out of medical supplies, Mike, and Mike would appreciate that and he would know it's very believable. Hmm. One of the things we didn't have enough of was ventilators. And back then the ventilators, I call them, oh, they're like dinosaurs. They were, they were the Emersons, they were big, they never worked. The ward master would come in and literally he would kick it. He would, he would be so angry, he would just kick it to get it to work. So we, need, we have progressed in over 50 years with our medical equipment, of course. But um, if we'd only had more ventilators, I think we could have saved more lives. I never ran out of narcotics. There was always plenty of um, analgesics and pain medication. Uh, I don't remember, um, we did run out of blood and we didn't have enough snake venom. And we had several patients die from snake bites because the antivenom that had to be live, I think, and the pilots would go to Thailand or someplace to get it. So, and that's where the guilt would come in. Like if the ifs, if we'd only had, maybe we could have saved this life. And then what was the second question? Oh, and if you had to do it again, what, what changes would you make? For my life? Yeah. Um, well, I did confess that if I knew what those 10 years were gonna be like, I never would have embarked on it. Cause of course I would not have had the faith in myself that I could do it. First of all, I would have said, I had never given a public speech in my life. I just, I had never raised money. I didn't know how to build a memorial in DC. I would have doubted myself. Hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm glad I persevered and I'm glad it's there. I, I have some personal regrets, Mike. Um, and, and one of them is I wish I'd spent more time with my four kids, but I have to confess, they're all great. <laughs> they're doing great kids. And they say, oh, mom, you were fine. Grandma was with us. 
she she took good care of us. So my kids have, they're proud. They they come to the memorial and they're proud of their mom and what she did in Vietnam. And my kids are very supportive and they turned out fine despite the fact that I was on a plane a lot. So I don't know what else, what I would change. Um, I have to say that the biggest benefit for me outside of that statue standing in Washington, DC, the fringe benefit is all the wonderful people I met and they are my friends today. People like Michael Cole and all those volunteers at the wall. Yeah. I mean, it's like we always have our arms around each other. We're, we watch each other's backs. We're, we're there for each other. We, we may be strangers, but we're not. And I get phone, since my book came out, now I get all this mail and wounded soldiers write and say thank you to me. And, and the women, the women veterans that now I have reconnected with is like the biggest joy, the biggest blessing in my life. It's like, it's like, this is what I've been given um, because of that statue that stands to honor them. I now have their friendship. I, I have their memories to share. And so it's it's pretty precious. Yeah. Well, uh, Diane, the despite all the challenges in making the memorial, it's it's so well received, and um, it's not just for women, but I. It seems it's my impression, and and you can you can correct me or redirect this as you see fit. Um, but that you know one of the great gaps that it fills is that. You know, it's not just women, but it's it's parents who see their sons and daughters in that picture, and it's sisters, and it's it's girlfriends. And um, was that intentional at all in that, or is that just people bringing their own emotions to the larger story? Well, that's an excellent question because I'll tell you what happened. When I founded the Vietnam Women, when I thought there has to be a statue there, right? Then I'm starting to write the strategy. Well, how is this going to happen? And, and who's going to do what? And where's the money going to come from? And all the questions. And, and this was for the women, that the women needed to heal. This was for recognition. It was to honor them and show the world what women had contributed uh, to our nation during the Vietnam War. And I hadn't begun to comprehend or even think how this would affect the men. That was the surprise. When I started getting letters from uh, my brother veterans who'd served in Vietnam or not, whether they, whatever, wherever they'd served around the world, they would write and say um, how much they appreciated um, the women they were serving with and they wanted to say thank you. There were some ugly letters and, and they went in the wastebasket. Of course they did. The majority of them, these were, unbelievable, heartwarming letters from the men saying, what can I do to help? And then one of them said, Diane, you shouldn't be doing this. We should be doing this for you. Huh. This is backwards. And you know, they sent money. They sent letters to Congress. They sent letters to the editor. Um, they were behind us. And if without them, we would not have built that memorial. And you know, the majority of veterans in the American Legion and the VFW and Disabled American Veterans and BVA, Vietnam Veterans of America and uh, Paralyzed Veterans Military, all of those veterans, the VSOs, Veteran Service Organ, that got behind us. That's what got that memorial built, their power and influence and money. Mm -hmm. So when I said I had allies, allies, oh my gosh, there are thousands of them, if not millions. Mm -hmm. And it was the majority of veterans are men. And once they got behind us, we got the memorial built. And isn't that, I mean, that's a beautiful story. I mean, when we're in the military, we are, uh, should be uh, on a mission and we should be there to help each other get home and um, to accomplish that mission. And um, that's the heroic part of, of a story is when we take care of each other and help each other come home and then when we're come when we're, when we're home, we help each other heal. And, and so I hope that answered Mike's question. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Let's see if there's some more, more questions here, hang on. This is from, uh, how do I, uh oh, I'm having technical trouble here. Uh, let's hang on one sec, give me, bear with me. Ah, there we go, okay. This is from a Karen Neary 
She says, thank you for this fantastic event. I reached out to you when I was teaching middle school. I would do a mini lesson on Vietnam that tried that tied into the story we read. One of the main teaching tools I used was the 60 minute video that you just talked about. You invited me to come to speak at the memorial about how I got seventh graders to appreciate those who served. I appreciate that opportunity. I read your book and I wonder if it served as a healing process for you and if you could share that story. Ooh, that's a great question. Erin, I remember you. <laughs> I definitely remember you. I was very impressed with you. Um, yes, my book, I was terrified to write it. That's why I put it off. I really did not want to relive Vietnam. And I didn't want to share my heart and soul with the world. I'd already done that, working 10 years on that memorial. And I, I just didn't want to dig any deeper. And my co-author made me dig deeper. And um, thanks to him, helping to frame the book and and encourage me to tell everything and he said at the end of the day it's your story you bet last if you don't want it in there we'll take it out but tell me everything and yes it was when I finished the book I felt this it's like the last burden um, the archives that I've been collecting all these years went to the Library of Congress, 40 boxes of them. <laughs> believe oh, wow. it or not. And so everything is in the Library of Congress now. I sent it there after I finished my book. So I had all that information at my fingertips to put into the story in the book, all the testimony and dates and all of the above. But um, I just, I, felt, I don't think I had Bob cross anything out when we, when we were doing the editing. I just left it all in there. I just, I, I told it as honestly as I could from memory and from notes and my diary and calendar entries. And I just felt this burden was now lifted that this was like the last chapter of my life. I know I have another chapter with my husband, you know, to go traveling and do that. But um, my, my military, my, my Vietnam experience has now, it's in healing wounds. And now I can, I can go on and mm. the story is there. And um, if, if people want more, they can go to the Library of Congress, obviously. But it was a huge burden lifted and I didn't realize um, that I would feel that way. Honestly, I have to tell you, I was, I was terrified. I was terrified that when people started reading my book, they would do to me what they did when I started the Vietnam Women's Memorial. And that was make ugly phone calls to me. That was write me nasty letters. That was threaten me. I mean, I, if you read my book, I was threatened. I mean, I had people threaten me that if I didn't stop doing what I was doing, they would. Uh, and I, I had to, re, I relived all of that fear that I couldn't sleep at night because some guy was gonna come and kill me because I was trying to build a statue honoring women. I mean, that was very real. But none of that has happened. Nobody has threatened to kill me. I haven't gotten one nasty letter. Um, nothing terrible happened. And I, I can sleep at night. I, you know, my nightmares are now with Ukraine and what's happening in Ukraine. That's a whole nother. Yeah. I'm not sleeping well. But um, yes, to answer your question, Karen, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I finished the book. Um, I know that it'll get where it's supposed to go someday, the classrooms. Um, and I want it to inspire our younger generations of military women to know that they can fight back against all the bad stuff that's out there with happening in military today for women that happened to us too, sexual mm -hmm. assault, rape, that we have a voice, that we can stand up and be heard and demand um, things that, you know, are happening to us in the military still to this day, that again, persistence overcomes resistance, that women want to join, many women want to be in the military today. They want to serve their country and they are amazing women. You know, look at what women are doing today that we were not allowed to do. We couldn't even go to West Point. I couldn't even be in ROTC. Yeah. Um, the doors that have been opened for them because of our service, and World War One, Two, Korea, all women, we've stood on each other's shoulders. Um, 
next generations um, thrive and do better because of our service, because we proved we, we're not shrinking violets, uh, we can do it. So, yeah. That's great. And Karen also adds, um, well, she, it's a it's a message that I'll pass on after the program, but she would uh, she would like to get back in touch and I'll, I'll send you her info uh, when we reconnect, Diane. So that's great. Well, Diane, you know, thinking about what you just said, one of the questions I always ask our volunteers here and certainly, you know, your, your crew from the wall down in DC, if there was, you know, if there's one idea about the era itself, about the war, you know, if we had to, if we had to put Vietnam in a box for a future generation and say, this is what it means, this is why it matters, this is why it won't ever go away, and why you have to do your role in understanding that moment in time, what, what is the lesson to pass on? What, what do future generations need to understand about really the crossroads of your generation? Well, it's what I tell my grandchildren, I guess, is to question, don't believe. <laughs> Our generation was known as anti-establishment, right? Hmm. Rebel, rebel against the institutions, re rebel against your parents, Get wear the long hair, uh, wear weird clothes, uh, smoke pot, uh, do wild music and, you know, Woodstock, uh, you know, all the things of the 60s. I mean, it's it's a fascinating era. My kids would say, Mom, you lived in a really cool area. My, that's so boring now. I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was an amazing era. It was colorful to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, but young people then, I'm proud of my generation. I'm not proud of those who, who protested us, the veterans. I know I, what happened there with the protest, the war, but you know, those of us who served, we only did what our country asked us to do. And some of us were under orders, the men who were drafted. So that in of itself, but to, to question this, question the politicians, don't believe them, they do lie. And um, don't swallow their Kool-Aid. Um, question the legitimacy of the reasons to go to war and stand up and protest and march. If you believe it's anti-American, uh, if it's not a war we should be fighting, um, I believe in defense. Uh, I'd love to be a pacifist, but we do need to defend our nation. Yeah. What we really need to do is defend our democracy and defending our nation is defending our democracy. And if we put Vietnam in a box, it shows that young people rose up, they protested and they marched for and they marched against us. Uh, the music uh, in Vietnam, for me, music was the most precious thing I had because it, it kept me, uh, I had hope, because a lot of that music was, was, was about us. Where have all the soldiers gone? Yeah. Um, and it, it was about, it was for us, and it was about us. And I didn't feel like the music was against us. The music was a social commentary about what was happening in our country, and it was very anti-war, a lot of it. Um, I, music can express so much of in our in our nation what i don't know in in a way that other things can't but um so to look at our generation that we served we sacrificed we died and we came home and we contributed to america mm -hmm. but we also suffered and the, the number of suicides because of the emotional wounds that weren't recognized and because of how we were treated when we came home. Um, I had a close friend who committed suicide and um, I found his body. He had called me the night before. It was 11 o'clock at night. And um, my husband said, the phone's for you. I said, 11 o'clock at night, who's calling me? And he said, Diane, you, you can't understand this, but I can't live without her. And he hung up. And I went back to sleep and, well, that's, what's that about? And the next night um, I went to the 
support group that another veteran and I had started for Vietnam vets in rural River Falls, Wisconsin. And um, we found him. Mm -hmm. And he had told me, Diane, I could take what I took in Vietnam, but I can't take what's happened to me here at home. Huh. And it was all about the, uh, the lack of, um, well, it was outright hostility. And it was painful. And then his family, some of his family had rejected him and then his wife. And we lost him, um, uh, like thousands more that have gone before us from taking their own lives. Yeah. And so when we put Vietnam in a box, we know that veterans came home to hostility and it affected us and lives were lost after the war ended. And it was Vietnam veterans who went on to Congress and said, we've had enough, we need some help with Agent Orange. We need um, service connected with the VA. The VA needs to be taking better care of us. And they are, thanks to Vietnam vets. Thanks to Vietnam vets, we have the Vet Center, which started in 1979. And we have over 300 now, about 300. And every state in the United States, because of Vietnam vets who got that started, for the wounds of war. So what we have done, gone on to do and, and the founders of the wall, uh, what they did to, to bring this nation together to heal. Um, these are remarkable veterans. And this is what I say, um, you know, the greatest generation, we know they were great. The World War II generation and they pulled together and the heroic uh, things that they did all over the world. But this is what I have to say is that there is greatness in every generation and undeniably in ours. And um, I'm proud of our generation. I'm not proud of a lot of things that, have hap that happened during that era, of course, but um, I I'm proud of how we stepped up to serve and we came back and if we survived, that we have gone on to be um, good citizens, still fighting for our democracy. And I can't tell you how many women veterans, some of them have become judges. Uh, some of them became medical doctors. Uh, they left the nursing profession. Some of them are pilot. I mean, they, women went on at, to become, they used that experience and the GI Bill, if you will, mm -hmm. to go on and, and, and be remarkable people and citizens. So. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, thank you. Diane, you um, you inadvertently stumbled into a, a tried and true question that we love to ask here at the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation. <laughs> and that is if there is one song, and and this is the last question here, I promise. Uh, if there's one song that would be your vote for the song of the era that bring that speaks to your experience, what would that be? Well, it's Peter, Paul and Mary. Uh -huh. And I, I met Peter Yarrow. He came here to Helena, Montana to sing. And all of his songs are my favorite, but mm -hmm. you can imagine which one. I was stunned that he would come to Helena, Montana to our small, beautiful little Myrna Loy center. And I got tickets immediately. And I sat there and I cried through the whole thing. And there was a break and he was going to sell his CDs. So I went out and everybody was there buying CDs and I stood back and I wasn't going to fight the crowd. I waited till the very last person left and he had to get back into the theater to sing his second half. And I just walked up to him and I looked at him and I said, Mr. Yarrow, um, I need to tell you that I was a nurse in Vietnam and I listened to your music while I was there. And I started to cry. <laughs> and I said, you have no idea what your music meant to us. Um, the inspiration and the hope and that somebody cared about us. and he took my hand and he kissed it. He took my hand and he kissed my hand. And that was, that was it. I didn't buy his CDs, I didn't need to. I have, his, I have all his music. Um, 
And it was just a really touching moment. But I, I really wondered, did he have any idea how much his music meant to us? Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't comprehend that he would, unless some nurse like me had come up to him and said, do you have any idea what, what it meant to us? Um, so that, that was a moment that I felt like was this gift that I had an opportunity to say thank you to an American citizen who, who helped make my life a little more bearable um, when I was spending hours in my hooch alone, writing letters home and getting sleep to get up to the next day to, to go to work. Um, mm. So music. Yeah, the music of the 60s in a box, to answer your question now, in grand finality, the grand finale, music was, the 60s music is, was the most defining music of any generation. Well, no, I can't say that. World War II music was phenomenal. No, you, you can say it. It's but, okay. <laughs> um, it, it was, music was just the, the def and then Woodstock, and it was on a dairy farm, no less. I was raised on a dairy farm, and there was there no <laughs> way I wanted to be at Woodstock with all those, like, I wouldn't, what would I, I was a veteran, and what would they do to me if I went, if, if I went to Woodstock and my, if I had gone to Woodstock in my combat boots and my jungle fatigues and my boonie hat, how would they have treated me? Yeah. Mm. Um, even this farm girl who was used to being on a dairy farm. Mm. Woodstock troubled me. Um, I didn't understand it when I came back from Vietnam. I didn't understand that how people could be having fun. Young people should be having fun. That's what you're supposed to be doing. But I, I couldn't understand young people having fun. It, it, it was foreign to me when I came back. I couldn't have fun. Yeah. I had mm. lost, lost my joy. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Diane, the the audience is 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 adding to the sentiment I'm about to share with you. But thank you so much for your service, and welcome home. Um, to our audience, thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, it's a privilege to have you participate, and uh, join us again uh, in, in April 28th. Uh, Kara Vuick, who is a historian of the Army Nurse Corps who's interviewed Diane and many others about their experiences in Vietnam from their inspirations to joining, uh, the trauma they experienced, um, dating, all of the above. It's literally a, a fantastic read. Um, you, can, uh, you can find it on Amazon, but Carol will be here to talk uh, all about that uh, in greater detail and look for future programs. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And Diane, thank you again so much. A, a genuine honor to finally meet you and speak with you in person. And uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Mike. It was my pleasure.